I kind of wanted to try to achieve a thrash album that was truly psychedelic, but still super fast and not atmospheric, which is often just an excuse for watering things down and slathering everything in digital reverb and synths and making it, you know, kind gentle black metal for funerals and weddings. I wanted it to be like aggressive, but also psychedelic. What's up everybody? Keefe from ghostcultmag.com here with the awesome John from Hammers of Misfortune. I am so stoked to talk to you today. Hello. How uh, good. I'm laughing because this is my first ever Zoom interview. Technology, so. man. It's only <laughs> it's, it's only as good as it it is when it works. That's what I it's, like to say. The Zoom boom. Yeah, man. Uh you but know, I can play with the camera. Yeah. That we can get fun angles. Um, you know, I like to tell people, hey there, guitars. What a nice wall of guitars and basses you have there. Uh, you know, I tell people it's really interesting, like in the before the pandemic hit and went worldwide in North America, uh, Zoom had like 120,000 users on March 1st, 2020. And then on April 1st, 2020, they had 2 million people sign up. So <laughs> it's never been the same. And um, I used to... I lived in Brooklyn and I did these interviews in person and then I moved to San Francisco to get away from Brooklyn. And now most of these interviews have not been in person. So it's been fun for me too. I like, I like people actually humans and I like humans humaning sometimes at shows. So there's been a few ones in person, a couple of festivals, but not like it used to be where I used to go rub shoulders in like the bowels of a club or, you know, on stage after sound check before a show, you know? Yeah, one of those backstage interviews where it's like you barely hear what they're saying because of all the noise from the sound check and stuff going on. I have good gear though, so that was never <laughs> a problem for me. I once uh my one of probably my favorite interview ever is uh Rest in Peace Dave Brocky from Gore Odorous and I interviewed Dave Brocky while uh Amana Marth was sound checking like two doors down from us. And we were fine. We were drinking Heineken's and my microphones held up and we heard everything each other said. It was actually one of his last interviews ever. But I am so glad you're back, man. Ham I a month ago, five weeks ago, I did not know this new album was happening. And then it's like press release, interview time schedule, it talking to you, and then it's right around the corner after this so you know just welcome back well thank you so good to have you back hammers is a band hammers and misfortunes a band that i absolutely love i have my my copy of 17th street right here oh bitchin that i got over the summer from the uh from a little antique mall in las vegas where metal blade like sells stuff oh cool <laughs> <laughs> uh, just like a weird uh you know i went to psycho las vegas and metal blade has like a weird pop-up kiosk in an antique mall for some reason and it's awesome they have two huh. like one place that has like records and tapes and another side that has like shirts they're trying to get rid of so it's a lot of fun um if you want to if you feel up to it if you want to catch us up on you know what's what's been that arc like since kind of the hiatus to coming back because you it's, it's i think this this record's amazing and you know Thank i can't you. wait to hear you talk about it uh well <clears throat> we um we moved to Montana after we recorded uh, the last album, Dead Revolution, concurrently with the last Vol record, Deeper Than Sky. Uh, both Sigurd and I worked on those two together. She played bass on the Vol record and she played keyboards on the Hammers record, of course. And she was pregnant the entire time we were making those records with our son. Um, after he was born, I had to finish those two albums. Um, which was a, um, I liken it to like, if you're throwing like a Hail Mary pass, right? To yourself from pre-fatherhood self, here, catch this, you know? The baby's born and that ball's in the air and I got to try to catch it with holding a, you know, a tiny little baby. <laughs> uh, I did the, the, the inner, the gatefold art for Dead Revolution with the baby in my lap, you know, like throwing up on me, trying to, hand write out all those lyrics uh it was brutal but uh you know after when he right around the time he turned two we concluded that uh we did not want to raise our our boy in san francisco so we looked into moving and the idea of montana just kind of came just came out of the blue i don't know there was no like we didn't really have much of a connection here or anything like that but 
So that's part of the reason it took so long to get another record out is because relocating your entire family and your entire life to a brand new place takes a long time. Um, not only that, but it uh, couldn't be more different from our lifestyle in San Francisco. There was a lot to learn about snow and bears and putting chains on your tires and how to use a snow plow. You know, what to do when the rain washes out half your driveway and, you know, got to get the dump trucks up full of gravel and you have to fix things yourself. You know, nature is not uh, uh, to be trifled with around here. So it was uh, all new shit. So I was sort of trying to write the record um, when and where I could being a full-time parent with a, jo a job at night. And I didn't have any idea what I was writing for, what band I was writing for both. You know, I arrived in Montana effectively with two dead bands Vol is dead, Hammers is dead, basically because I'm far away from everybody. You know, everybody's so busy. I can barely get them together to do a practice when I did live in San Francisco. <laughs> so what do you do? I'm like, well, I don't know. What do I want to do? I want to start writing some music. So I would just start smacking out riffs, you know, that's how it started. Anyway, am I rambling? Oh, you're good. That's the long short of it. And, uh, you know, uh, life gets in the way sometimes when you're busy making art and plans. And, uh, you know, family first is, is a thing I believe in anyway. And uh, it's like, dude, it's like art gets in the way sometimes when you're trying to do life. <laughs> that's also true. That is also true. I mean, most of the time you don't have time to work on your art. Even if you think about it all day long and all night long, you lay awake at night thinking about all the cool stuff you want to do. Most of the time, you know, a lot a lot of times you can't do that you can't it's like you want it all but you can't grab it hey because you got shit to do montana sounds cool and having lived here now for a year and a half i recognize that there are the same challenges in brooklyn or boston that there are in san francisco although it's just less people which i like and um, you, live in, uh, you live in the city proper i live in the city proper but i have lived at different times in my life in the sticks so i can appreciate montana sounds a lot like new hampshire and uh, or maine in the winter which i have endured a little bit and yeah. uh yeah, can be a lot, and uh, a life a lifestyle change is not easy at any rate. Uh, sure, ain't avocado toast and craft beers. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. For real, real life, Montana. Uh, but it sounds peaceful and probably really great in terms of raising a, a kid. Well, he can. You know, the thing is that he can go outside and play, and without getting run over by a fucking Uber driver. For sure. You know what I mean? Like, it's not concrete and right angles everywhere. He can go out and play in the, you know, in the snow, in the woods. He can go sledding in the yard. The only thing we got to watch out for is fucking bears and mountain lions. And they are definitely around, for sure. Which is which is scarier to me. I feel like a mountain lion is even more random and scary than a bear. You know what's fucking scarier is pimps getting shot to death outside your front window when you're trying to put your kid to sleep facts and that that is not an exaggeration no i know i lived that's, in that shit for almost 30 years yeah that's the but whole that's city not that's not window. just like tenderloin or yeah that's everywhere no it was on 20th street in san francisco yeah, yeah. I know even it. even through all the gentrification after it became yep. ground zero for everybody who worked in <clears throat> fucking twitter and facebook and all that shit at night it was a red light district yep even through uh, in front of all those million dollar single bedroom condos there's hoes strolling around after 10 p.m and i worked at night i'd be riding my bicycle through that shit at 2 a.m you know every night on my way home from work and uh i would take bears and mountain lions over that any day get i get that I get that deeply, uh, especially now I'm living in it. Uh, I know, but yeah, that's it's just uh, too much. I, you know, it was it was fine. It was fine. I lived in that shit for so long. It was just part of the scenery. But then when you have to explain that, like imagining explaining that to a three year old, you know, Daddy, why are there you know tents all along that one street? Why are, why don't those people have houses? You know, mm. I I'm gonna have to explain that to him. Yeah. You know? He's it's wild now, so he's starting to understand the evil ways of the world. But I don't want to have, I don't, you know, I don't want him to be, you know, he uh, he got a, a face full of crack smoke when he was one and a half years old, just strolling him by a, a homeless encampment. It was an accident, you know. We f we forgot to cross the street with, I forgot to cross the street with the stroller, you know, before going by the the tent city, and that was when we were like, we need to get out of here. Uh, that would be, yeah. That would be the time. You know, again, I fully appreciate that. Again, I don't think 
a lot of people elsewhere in the country are talking shit on the town without having lived through it or in it. There are very fine parts of the city and there are very fine things about living here, but yeah, just like anywhere else. I, I loved it. I love it. There was It was such a wonderful place, especially when I first landed there. It, it was great. And it's a beautiful area. You know, uh, I'm not talking shit. This is shit that, that um, goes on in all over the world, every urban area. Yeah. You know, and it's a function of um, what, it, you know, basically it's a function of the haves and haves nots, income inequality. You know, people are getting, as uh, to quote the lyrics on Overthrower, uh, priced out of life itself. Ah. You know? Indeed, indeed. So, yeah, man, I, I wanted to um, get into Overtaker, man. This record is amazing. Um, I don't know what the sort of if you started to write it and then sort of came upon, oh, you know, I need some more hands to help out or if you had planned all along to write with other collaborators in mind. But this record is pretty stunning with uh, rimming with talent in addition to yourself and uh, your your misses. I was <clears throat> I was like I said, I was just writing shit. I didn't really know what I was doing or what to do because everything had changed, you know? Um, everybody was really, really busy, uh, but I, I really, I liked the direction, the sort of the, the direction that I stumbled across with the Vol record, Deeper Than Sky. I thought, you know, I've always had thrash in my heart, like thrash is my first love, really. I was really interested in sticking with that sort of direction with like, let's push thrash to some other level, you know. People think that thrash is played out and the re-thrash and all that thrash pizza bullshit, you know, but I'm like, no, no I think that thrash has some potential. <laughs> so I started thinking about, well, I don't have a band at all. So if I, if I could play with anybody, who would I play with? And my first thought, of course, was Blake Anderson, my favorite contemporary drummer. I'm like, oh man, if I could play with Blake, that would be incredible, you know, it'd be a dream come true. So I I got his digits, man, and I called him and he was like, yeah, sure, I'll do that. <laughs> and I hung up the phone and I was like, yes, I get to work with Blake Anderson, holy shit. So that kind of upped the, uh, the ante for me, right? Now you're working with uh, somebody you really admire, you know? So you definitely want to put your best foot forward. So it kind of, you know, the stakes were a little higher after that. Because let's be honest, I really wanted to impress Blake. <laughs> and I wanted to give him a challenge he could sink his teeth into. Now, an interesting thing about Blake, I did not know this when I first started writing with him, but this guy... Um, for the past five, six years, and basically for most of his life, has been um, studying classical piano, jazz piano, music theory. He is a very learned musician, and he can read, sight read music and all that stuff. I did not know this at all. He didn't tell me. If I had known that when I was, you know, first sharing riffs back and forth with him, I would have been sending him fucking sheet music and all kinds of shit. But, you know, that'll be for the next record, I guess. That's awesome. I'm so glad to hear the words next record, too. But let's get this <laughs> one is yet to come even. Uh, I met Blake. Blake's a wonderful person. And what I love about Blake and his drumming is, you know, a lot of drummers today, the modern, a lot of modern drummers are a little too pretty because it's like a lot of black metal and death metal speed and technicality, which I love. No, no disrespect. But I love drummers that actually hit drums like they're meant to be. This is a rhythm instrument for a reason. And uh, something a lot different about a drummer that plays with a physicality as opposed mm -hmm. to not. That's yeah. just my personal taste. But I'm are, you, a, are you a drummer? No, I play bass. So I've always been interested in drummers. Yeah, yeah, me too. I love bass and drums, of course. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I absolutely adore the bass as an instrument. You know, the way I write guitar, you know, guitars and the string section. I, I like writing as a string section for two guitars and a bass. Uh, so it's like you're writing for a string trio. And the bass is, you know, all about bridging that gap between the drums and the guitars. And But it's also got its own, holding its own melodic space in music as well. Uh, I think bass is criminally underutilized in, in a lot of metal. Hard agree, hard agree. And so I assume... If I'm going to assume, I assume through Blake, we got Frank. Yeah. I mean, Blake was like, we should get Frank. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, we did get Frank. Unfortunately, he only gets, 
he's only on two songs on the album. He was going to do the whole thing, but he got busy with Crip Sermon and Eternal Champion and uh, repping my favorite band, Ava. With a new album out. Yeah. Fucking burn, burn too. Fucking killer. Straight fire record, man. I love it. So those guys are fucking sick. I love Deva. And uh, he got real busy with all that stuff. And then the pandemic happened and everything was fucked anyway. So can I, am I allowed? You can, this is our YouTube and we're already, you know, we, <laughs> we try our best to stay clean and monetize things, but fuck that. So go right ahead and be you. Uh, yeah, I can, I can turn off the, cussing like that i have a, an eight-year-old so yeah uh, yeah now <laughs> yeah. then the freaking pandemic happened right gosh bum, darn bum, it bum. <laughs> dun 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 uh, yeah. yeah so he got you know he everybody you know you remember what happened everything changed man like everybody had shit to deal with people were getting sick and people were moving and jobs were being shut down and people you know I, I don't want to bring all that shit up, you know, but it, that was a real thing. And it's still, the repercussions are still working themselves out. And that threw everything into a fucking tail, a freaking tailspin with Frank. And then Blake uh, injured his wrist. It, and then he was out of the picture for oh, a year because of that. He um, got in an accident, taking his scooter to work. He flew off the scooter at about 30 miles an hour with, with his hands out like that and broke his wrist and did the typical, you know, no healthcare move where you're like, well, it's probably, it'll probably take a, a month to heal, you know, and it, it never healed. So he had to have it rebroken and, you know, surgery and everything. So that took him out of the picture for a good year. And yeah, it was... It was not ideal, man. <laughs> yeah, especially for a drummer, that's a huge bummer. I mean, obviously, he he can't he he um he worked really hard to recover, and it took a you know about another year almost for him to recover. And then we got into the studio and recorded his drums fucking live, man. I mean, there are a couple spots where we took a song in chunks, you know what I mean? But those drums are live; they are not edited. Not a single intern touched or put scissors <laughs> to those tracks nice i feel like a couple of months back i interviewed uh steve blanco for imperial triumphant and he alluded to he's like oh i just did a keyboards on a top secret project that's gonna come out it's gonna surprise you i think he was talking about this record he was yeah he is a, he is a, speaking of jazz pianists and and uh you know, lovers of music much more than just ex extreme metal. Steve is a, is a, a wonder. Yeah, you know what? I I never met the guy. Um, we've communicated through texts and emails and so forth. Uh, but he seems like an awesome dude. And you know, I do plan on doing another record with Blake. I want Steve to be involved with it as well. You know, in in some capacity or other. I I have no. We have not talked about this there's no plans or anything but you know i'll i'll be hitting him up for sure in one respect or another i mean his style of bass playing is is really you know they they like to do that kind of atonal thing and uh i'm very consonant so i don't know if uh, for bass he would be a good fit but it's it's fun to specul speculate about it you know word i love the idea of that and you never know i mean you know what isn't possible with with hammers that's what i love about this band it could be it could be anything but it could also be very specific too and i think some of that has to do with you some of that has to do with jamie some of that has you know just um you know there the possibilities are endless uh, i don't want to forget to shout out other people like brooke mike or Tom. Tom is one of my favorite people in music. I just saw him also recently on tour. Yeah, so Tom, he's a great guy. He's I'm in guy. awe of just, just watching yeah. Tom in different projects. And uh, and Jamie was Jamie is largely responsible for this whole thing actually happening and at all because we didn't have we were really had no idea what to do about vocals at all. I would do this thing on Friday nights where I'd sit there with um, the headphones on and just scan Bandcamp, looking for like really good singers who were singing over really fast thrash, you know, and not finding a whole lot. And then Jamie emails me one day and she's like, hey, are you working on anything? Cause I'd kind of like to do some vocals on something uh, if you got anything. I'm like, well, yes, <laughs> in fact I do. So, and then she took that ball and ran with it, man. You know, that's, that's what brought the whole thing home. 
Killer, I'm so glad. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure it must be gratifying. You know, you were kind of on a hiatus for family and other reasons, and I don't know if you ever get, you know, down or, you know, contemplative about, you know, if you were going to continue to make music in some way, shape, or form, but, you know, it has to be gratifying that people do want to work with you, man. I, I, I don't know. Just personally, I, I think it's cool that, like, there's a army. You might have moved away from this, you know, supposed cultural center, but the one thing about this weird technology bubble we're in is that we are all, we can all make music together, you know, we can all communicate. Yeah, that became especially clear after uh, the pandemic hit and everybody was isolated. Um, this The reason for the scare quotes is because I think before the pandemic, people were pretty isolated by social media. And, you know, I'm not sure how non-isolated anyone really was in 2020 to begin with. <laughs> but, but yeah, moving out here, there's really no choice. There's no, you know, there's no, there's no rehearsal spaces around here. There's no guitar center. There's hardly any music scene unless you consider some bluegrass stuff or um, jam grass. I found out that there is such a thing as jam grass after we moved here. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's bluegrass jam bands, like deep, trashy, hippie shit. <laughs> So yeah, not much of a scene around here. So it was, you know, the remote thing would have happened pandemic or no for me. It just made me change my outlook on things because ha not having access to a practice space or a, a lineup for the band, but still possessed of a compulsion to make music and wanting to make records. That's what I like to do, you know? Um, that's really the only thing I'm good at. So I have to do it. So how am I gonna do this? You know, and it sort of became clear it was going to be uh, something remote, you know, but we did make sure to get into the same room with Blake and go down to electrical audio and record the fucking drums live just because that's the way I wanted to do it. Nothing against people who are doing their drum samples and their quantitized fucking blocks of MIDI drums and so on and so forth. And I do that shit too when I'm making demos, you know, but for an album, it just has to have real drums for me i just i i just can't even if it's super inconvenient and so on it's just that's to my ears that's what i need to hear right on i'm so stoked that you got to work at electrical audio and uh, oh man I, me too <laughs> I, I also scan band camp uh, i'm a band camp person and a fan an aficionado and i like to see where albums are made you know credits and where they're made i read the stuff people probably don't read so i think up half of these questions actually and i'm stoked to see so many records still coming out of a uh, that place and uh, mm. the love for that building and the love for Steve and, and just what he's built there. That was a bucket list thing for me to do is actually go record something at Electrical Audio. And to go to Electrical Audio was, as kind of a studio nerd, that was definitely a dream come true. But to go there and record Blake freaking Anderson at Electrical Audio, I was over the moon, man. Highlight of my career with a K. Highlight of my career, definitely. Awesome. Let's talk a little bit about the music. Um, you know, so many things I would like to unpack, but I was trying to find an overarching theme. It's just another great Hammers record to me, but uh, I don't know if it was conscious or not. There's there's some stuff in there that seems unified. There's a lot of O titles in the song titles. I don't know if that was accidental <laughs> or on purpose, but uh, yeah, if there's anything like you want to discuss about the record or, you know, any overarching themes you want to share or not share, uh, that's fine too. Um, well, Back when I was a, a youngin, oh, a long time ago, let's just say a long time ago. I mean, I've been 36 for a long time, dude, a long time. So when I was a very young, a young boy running around in knee pants, I, I was super into discharge, right? Like this is hear nothing, see nothing, say nothing, era discharge. And I was super into Black Sabbath Paranoid, right? I would put these records on one right after the other and back again. And I was super into fucking Hendrix, man, especially Electric Ladyland and Axis Bold as Love, those two records. And I always dreamed of like, what would happen if you like could combine these things, you know, because Venom to me, especially on the first two albums, and then they did in their early career, they did a series of EPs, which are fantastic. The um, Die Hard, Acid Queen, Bursting Out EP, Warhead, 
Manitou, you know, that series of EPs they did it are all fantastic. That group, that body of work from Venom always seemed deeply psychedelic to me. And if, especially on black metal, if you listen to, well, the original vinyl version of black metal, where um, the song Don't Burn the Witch goes into a soundscape, a hellish, like a hellscape of sound with screams coming out of the depths of hell. And then Kronos starts doing this fucking monologue. The dark silhouette of a creature poised, you know. <laughs> It's Love like, it. yeah, man, that's fucking, that is tripped out shit. It's so cool, man. So ahead of their time. Yeah, I, if anybody hasn't heard this moment, it's just one of the best moments in all of music to me when he starts talking about the dark silhouette of the creature. <laughs> Waits eagerly. <laughs> and there's this feedback and noise and screams and shit coming out of the depths of hell it's just fantastic stuff right so to me like if you take a, a moment like that and then you take the Jimi hendrix song uh 1983 it's called off of electric ladyland where they go into like he sings this song about i don't know if you're familiar with the song but it's got one indeed of, i am a huge hendrix fan yeah it's got one of the most beautiful and one of the earliest examples of a, a an arpeggiated guitar harmony in all of rock and roll which is absolutely drop dead gorgeous and then it goes into this soundscape everything drops down and it's just ride cymbals with tape delays on them and and uh it goes into this really re deeply psychedelic soundscape it's kind of a almost precursing some of the stuff that was on in the core of the crimson king uh, i believe a year later Court of the, in the Court of the Crimson King was 69. Yeah, 69, yep. You know, improv, using the studio as an instrument, soundscapes and all this shit. At the same time, you know, I was into Discharge. So I was like, if you could combine all these things together, like, what would it sound like, you know? So that was kind of a thesis that I've had in the back of my head for a very long time. And I think Overtaker is the first time I've really sort of come close to answering that question. Like, what would it sound like? So that was sort of the the thesis for the whole thing. I kind of wanted to try to achieve a thrash album that was truly psychedelic, but still super fast and not atmospheric, which is often just a, an excuse for watering things down and slathering everything in digital reverb and synths and making it, you know, kind, gentle black metal for funerals and weddings and shit, you know. I wanted it to be like aggressive, but also psychedelic somehow that's so, the quote that's the quote right there i love it um <laughs> uh i always thought hammers to me had a thing i'm a huge prog nerd from my childhood and i i love pink floyd but as much as i love the pink floyd everybody knows the classic era i like the era before that before they knew what they were doing like after sid but before the dark side so like i, I feel like hammers taps in maybe it's not on purpose but i that psychedelic soundtrack pink floyd the space rock pink floyd like i hear the, some uh, of that adam hart mother yeah man metal and obscure yeah, the, the niles song niles song's great and again yeah. some of that is also just i think inherently organ synthesizers in, a, in not a watered down way but in a tasteful way when you have people who know how to play that play and, and uh, Sean, baby yeah oh yeah i see it i know i i i was gonna nerd out toward the end on your gear but uh yeah man there's nothing replacing those old boxes and those old keyboards and things there's no there's no you can have a, a rack but there's no replacement so i always felt like there was a thread in hammer so i'm glad you said jimmy because i also yeah jimmy jimmy is still i still can't believe the leap in musicality and we could do a whole interview just on jimmy someday like yeah. i just like the guy was so far ahead of everything it's like van halen he was so far ahead of everybody it's weird it's wild um but yeah man this record's alan holdsworth man word oh yeah man <laughs> not just Uli the <laughs> <laughs> oh Uli, yeah um yeah man this record is very is really deep and you always write very you know pretty lengthy strong records you don't limit yourself which i also like so yeah man just uh so excited for this record to come out and for people to bring you know welcome this band back and uh you know thanks for following through on your vision and, and bringing it back because I think we need we need good records like this right now that are well, like I mean, sit I hope and listen. People like it, you know. It's it's a it's a big departure, 
And I know that since the gosh darn pandemic, <laughs> there's been a lot of records coming out. A lot of a lot of freaking records coming out. And uh, we're in a bit of a crowded field, from what I understand. And we're, it's a self-released album, so we don't have a, a team of... Let me tell you what happened with Metal Blade. We approached Metal Blade. They had an option on this one. You know, I approached them saying, you know, I've got a bunch of demos for the next Hammers record. And they're like, you know, the pandemic had just started and uh, nobody knows how to circle the wagons like Metal Blade, man. They're like, oh, no, 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 thank you. Uh, why don't you just go ahead and put that one out yourself? So we asked, you know, they weren't interested so we're self-releasing. And so this has been an interesting thing for me because there's a lot of details to deal with as far as promo goes. I think that if people hear it, they'll like it, but I'm none, I'm under no illusions about, you know, the popularity or, you know, how big Hammers of Misfortune is. We are a pretty obscure underground band. I think that people will like it. I hope as, as many people hear it as possible, but, you know, there's I, I don't expect that we're going to be getting uh, offers to play with them on a Marth or anything anytime soon. <laughs> they should be so lucky, but I hear what you're saying. That's a bummer about Metal Blade, but also I I, I understand that you know it's a business too. Uh, I love this record personally. I'm not just saying that. Obviously, I'm a fan also, okay. and I'm going to do what I can to help spread the word. You do have a good little team around you there. Uh, your publicist good. did a nice job. Uh, I definitely, literally, when I saw the email come across, comeback album, Hammers of Misfortune, I jumped out of my seat, this seat. <laughs> I jumped out of this seat and fist bumped the air because I was like, <laughs> yes, thank you. So, you cool. know, whatever happens, I hope this album leads to another album and, you know, some wiser other labels. Maybe this opens you up for other things. And, and there are definitely tons of labels out there who would be lucky to have you. And, uh... Well, I'm yeah, curious man. to see. I'm curious. By the way, there will be a vinyl. It's in the works. There will be an announcement about that in early November. And the CDs are in. I just have to put them up for pre-sale. So there's 250 copies. So and it's got amazing artwork. Oh yeah, Sephiroth blew it out of the water. You know, I'll be really curious to see how this goes um, on Bandcamp and elsewhere, streaming without a label. You know, uh, there's still like a lot of records that I've done in the past. I have no idea how many copies they sold. I have no idea if I'm owed mechanicals or anything like that. I have no idea how much they did on Bandcamp or streaming. I have no clue, man. So this time I'm the center of operations for everything. So I will see all those numbers and I will start to get an idea of, you know, what the labels would have been seeing for previous other releases where I don't have that information. Like the Wizard of Oz, we're going to peel back the curtain and know all the things. We'll see how much of our royalties they use to order beer, beer and pizzas on Fridays at the office, man. <laughs> you never know. John, man, it has been amazing chatting with you. Let's stay in touch. Thank you so much for this awesome album. All right, man. And uh, yeah, Over Overtaker comes out on December 2nd which I think is a Bandcamp Friday, by the way, for people. If you're going to be a slacker and not pre-order it, get oh, it on nice. Bandcamp Friday <laughs> so all the money goes to this fine group of artists. And, so uh, yeah, so man, putting out the next record. Yes, exactly. This record will pay for the next one. So if you love this band, support this band. Thank you so much for hanging out with Ghost Cult, man. I really appreciate you. All right, man. Cheers. Take care. Good talking to you. Take Stay care. away from cougars and bears yeah. <laughs> and mountain lions. Jesus. <laughs> Take care. All right, man.